This is an oral history interview conducted for the Witness to War Serving a Nation project at Nassau Regional High School on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. For the sake of this interview, please state your full name and community in which you now reside. Uh, my name is Francis J. Hines, and I, record, I reside at Thurwood Senior Residence, South Yarmouth, Massachusetts. Okay, so how did you end up in Cape Cod in the first place? I uh, originally came here in about 1958 uh, on vacation, and uh, we came back every year for about five or six years on our summer vacation, and we bought a house here in 1966, and we lived in it uh, in the summertime and then full-time in 1964. We moved here full-time. All right, so... When you decided to join join the Navy, what did your family think about it? What did my family think about it? I was, uh, when I went in the Navy, I was 25 years old, so the, fa the family didn't think much about it at all. I was, a I was an adult living on my own, so everything was fine as far as they were concerned, yes. What was your occupation, like your job, before you went? And join the Navy. I was a student at, at uh, Georgetown University Dental School. So, and, and I had joined the Navy while in Washington, D.C. in 1953. I had, I had been deferred in 1950 to complete my dental education. So I knew I would be called up at the end of that time. In 1953, I joined the Navy and uh, was sworn in, took my physical, all the requirements, while I was still at Georgetown University. I graduated in 1954 and was called up a month later for active duty. Why the Navy? Like, you could have joined any branch. Well, we were, uh, we were a Navy family. My two older brothers served in the Navy during World War II, so it was a natural thing for me to want, when I had to go, this was during the Korean War, of course, uh, I joined the Navy. So describe a typical day in, in the Navy on the job. My job as a dental officer was to take care of the dental needs of the personnel. So I was, my first duty station was Bainbridge, Maryland, which was a recruit depot where they, the uh, incoming recruits in the service uh, get their first exposure to military life. And, uh, it's the same whether it's the Army, the Navy, the Marines, the Coast Guard. They all have recruit training places where the, the inductees are first exposed to military life. Uh, my first duty at Bainbridge was at the uh, dental clinic where we took care of the incoming naval recruits. I was only there a month when I was ordered to sea duty. And I was stationed on a an escort carrier for the uh, remaining uh, time in the service, my active duty time. So most of my active duty, with the exception of a few months, I was at sea on a, an aircraft carrier as a dental officer. When you went, um, I'm sorry, when you went to join the Navy, what were you most sad to leave behind? What was I supposed to what? What were you, um, what was... What were you most upset to leave behind when you went to the Navy? Nothing, really. I knew, I knew that I would have to go into service since 1950. Uh, I was, uh, as I said, I was uh, deferred to complete my dental education because was the, at that time, the, uh, the military uh, were in dire need of, of physicians and dentists to, to serve the personnel. They just didn't have enough manpower to take care of that. So I knew where I'd be as soon as I got out of dental school. So it was, I was looking forward to it, really. What was your most vivid, what is your most vivid memory of, of the Navy? My most vivid memory of the Navy, uh, of course it was sea duty for me. So I was on an aircraft carrier at that time. I was uh, part of the third fleet, which is the Atlantic Ocean. It covers the area from uh, uh, from New York to Norfolk, and from Norfolk down to uh, probably the Carolinas. 
uh, so we were on duty. I was on duty on an, on an escort carrier at that time. Uh, it did a lot of, of uh, training aircraft pilots on, uh, and also at that time the Navy was just interested in, in helicopters. They were new to the services and uh, they were experimenting with a lot of these uh, uh, preliminary types of helicopters that they brought aboard to test out on the, on the ocean. So they did a lot of that. What was your scariest moment during the war? Was there a time where you felt most threatened or? No, not, not, no, not at all. What was your happiest moment during the Navy? Uh, I didn't really have any, as I recall now, I, I really didn't have any times in the Navy that were happier than others. Like all services, you, uh, you stand and wait lots of times, but uh, my, my duties in the Navy were, were preset. Uh, in other words, I knew exactly what I was to be doing. The only thing I didn't know is what station I would be at and when they would change it. Of course, no one knows that in the service. It's, you're moved where they need you at that present time. So uh, actually, my, my duty in the Navy was, was uh, I would classify it as very good, very memorable. I, I really enjoyed my time on active duty and service. I knew I didn't want to make a career out of it because I had am, uh, ambitions to go back to school and do further study. So uh, that's what I did when I was released from active duty. Describe your relationship with your colleagues in, during when you were at sea. Uh, my, my, my exposure and, and relationship with, with Navy personnel was nothing but good. It was excellent. I really, really enjoyed the, the men. Uh, I, uh, of course, when you're at sea and you're a dental officer, you're everybody's friend because when they get in trouble, they, uh, they come to you. You're the only person that they can go to. There isn't anybody else on the ship that can take care of them for those particular needs. So, uh, but I, I got along well, and I, I really enjoyed my time with in the service with the personnel. I thought they were all great, great people. What about the like the leaders, the um, the the officers, the Navy officers? The 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 naval officers, uh, medical personnel, dental personnel. Their, their time and their relationship with the, with the uh, other, other uh, operating staff on a, on a ship uh, is quite unique in that their, their duties only apply to that particular thing. They have nothing to do with the, with the running of the ship or the airplanes attached to it or anything else. So it's, it's, it's two different branches. And in the, serv in the Navy, they call that uh, line line duty and staff duty. Now, a line officer in the Navy is, a, is what you would consider a combat officer. He's either, he either has to do with the ship or he's, he, he may be a pilot, a naval pilot flying the planes off an aircraft carrier. The staff are the people who take care of the non-combat duties like the medical facilities and the, uh, the um, office facilities, uh, the uh, uh, supply and things like that. The food, all that is is, is non-combat type of training. Ship couldn't operate without them. They have to have them. But the, that's the way the services differentiate one from the other. Different branches of the same service. So I take it there was a lot. There was a lot of things happening on the ship at the same time. Am, am oh I yes, correct? absolutely. Yeah, they, uh, uh, on a ship, uh, it, it's busy all the time. I mean, uh, an aircraft carrier is a large vessel. Now, the one, the ones that, the one that I served on, it was the uh, USS Kula Gulf, which is a CVE, which means th that uh, that's the uh, hyphenation for a CV in the Navy is an aircraft carrier, and they have different types, different sizes. A CVE is an escort, a smaller carrier. And then uh, th th these were all World War II ships now. You have to remember this was only five years after World War II. So we were still utilizing the equipment that they used during the Second World War. Uh, an aircraft carrier is a busy, busy, busy when they have squadrons. Now, what a squadron is in the Navy is a, a group of airplanes 
that has a, 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 a definite number assigned to it so that they will call it a squadron. It depends what type of plane they're flying, either a fighter or a torpedo bomber. Or uh, uh, in our particular case, we had a lot of anti-submarine type of aircraft aboard that would go out, fly out, and they had sonar, big sonar instruments on these airplanes. These, by the way, these are very big, big airplanes. They're not small, they're very big airplanes. And they carried a lot of sonar gear. And what they did was anti-submarine type of patrols where they could pick up uh, the sounds of a submarine under the water. So you have all different types of aircraft. And depending upon what type of squadron is, is aboard your ship at that time, uh, now, our normal personnel on that ship were about 800, 850 men assigned to the ship. In other words, that's called ship's company. Uh, when we took squadrons aboard, that number could be two or three times that, depending upon how many squadrons you had aboard at any one time. So you could go from 800 to 12 or 1,500 men on that ship at a particular time. They're not there all the time, but they could be out there for anywhere from a few weeks to a few months, depending upon what they needed. So was your was your aircraft carrier you served on, uh, was it ever in any trouble or under attack or anything? No, never. We're, we were with the Atlantic Fleet. And during the Korean War, uh, that was a limited, a war limited to the Korean Peninsula. I, I'm sure you're familiar with what's going on now with Korea, North and South Korea. You fellas cover it, a lot of that in your studies in high school. We do. I'm sure you do. Well, at that time, the, the, uh, the Pacific Fleet, uh, the uh, aircraft carriers would fly uh, combat missions over North Korea, and, and that's where the fighting. There was very limited, almost no action on the sea, per se, as they had, did during World War II, where you had huge navies fighting each other out in the Pacific or in the Atlantic. Yeah. Um. Was there any, was there ever any doubt that you wanted to go in, onto the Navy? Did you ever feel any? No, no, I, I, I knew I would have to go. And uh, when the Korean War started and uh, so I had decided when, when they uh, were ready to call me up, I would be ready to go. That's why I joined the Navy actually six months before I ever graduated. So I was sworn in and, uh, and take, I had taken a physical. It was all set to go. All I had to do was they said that, that, that the, the, at the Navy Depot in Washington, D.C., we'll send you a letter. And, and that's when you go. And in the service, uh, uh, such as uh, the way I served, when you, you, you got a letter to report, you report it to that depot, wherever they sent you. Yeah. Now, some of my classmates that uh, were in the same uh, situation, uh, as an example, I was sent to Bainbridge, Maryland. Some of them were sent to, immediately to San Diego, California, where there was a big, a big naval facility in San Diego. And they were sent to the, to the San Diego Naval Hospital, which is a huge, huge facility. And that's immediately that. So they get they you were receive an order by mail. That's the way they did it. And then they gave you a, a, a specific time, travel time. They knew how many days it would take. They would allow you to get there. And then, so they would have a date on there when you had a report for duty. So that, that's the way it's done. Um, so what were your living quarters like while you were on the ship? On the ship, they had facilities. They had uh, 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 compartments. Uh, a ship, a ship like that, has huge number of compartments. You could get lost on it. In fact, there are, now I served for uh, two years on the ship. There were compartments I had never entered, never gone, never no. I had no reason to do it. The sick bay on a, on a ship, uh, uh, like an aircraft carrier, uh, one section would be is, is designated as a sick bay. All the medical facilities, dental facilities, are located in that specific area. All ships are built like that. Right? So you really, uh, um, 
uh, you don't see a lot of a, of a huge ship like that because there's no reason for you to be there. Uh, as I recall now, I think I was in the engine room once or twice in two years. You know, you would think, well, gee, when you walk through that, no, you never see them. It's such a big ship. And a lot of the personnel, you wouldn't know who they are. You, 800 people, there's no way that you, and you got up every morning and you did, when you were out of sea, you did exactly the same thing, pretty much the same thing as you did when you were on the land. You got up, you had a report for duty every morning, they had a roll call. And uh, that's when you had to account for everybody in your department. And then you went to work, they had a, uh, the routine, and I'm sure it's the same now, they had sick call, like eight to nine in the morning, when no matter what the problem is, if they didn't feel well for whatever reason, they would report to the sick bay. And the, the medical personnel would take care of them there. They would either confine them to the sick bay because they had bunks and everything in there, or if it was just they had a headache, or many times they just didn't feel like working, they knew how to take care of them. And uh, that, that's the way it was. You had a regular routine. You had appointments every day with personnel. They could come in, make an appointment to have work done on their teeth. We had a complete dental office on that ship. So they would, it was just like you would go to the dentist here. Only, the only difference is you're in the military. How many appointments did you have a day? You could have as many as you wanted in a day. But normally you would, you would uh, 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 the personnel would come in. Many times they would, they would come in and say, could I have my teeth cleaned? Sure, make an appointment. The corpsman, we had corpsmen, two or three corpsmen that worked in that department. Now a corpsman is like a, an assistant, like you have today, medical assistants and dental assistants. You have the exact same thing on the ship. So they would make appointments for them depending upon what you were doing. And then you also had time, any type of emergency was covered immediately. They would come right in. And there would be times there would be accidents on the ship and, and they would damage their teeth or something like that, they, a fall or they'd hit by something and you had to take care of those immediately. But otherwise it was just like practicing out in civilian life, no different. How did you stay connected to life going out on outside, um, outside the Navy? How did I stay connected? To everything happening in the world elsewhere. Oh, on, on a board ship? Uh, and today it's even more, it's quicker. They, uh, on a board ship today, they will know what's going on quicker than you do sitting on the land. They have, well, well of course you can understand everything is by satellite now. But at that time, it, you, you could stay connected. They, had, they did it through teletype machines and things like that by radio contact. So. And, uh, of course, they didn't have the satellite type of thing then. And, and uh, computers type of thing, you know, they didn't exist then. So it was done by, it, it was mainly done by radio phone or, or teletype machines. You don't even, they don't exist anymore. With, there was a tape attached to them, and they could send that out over the airwaves. So you could stay shut. You didn't have newspapers or anything like that, of course, but you didn't need them. You, you, we, we could... Uh, and uh, at time we did have television. They had they, they started. We had television sets on small, small rudimentary black and white televisions. They had those, and um, and radios, of course. We listened to the World Series when we were out at sea or anything like that. So, so communications was good. There was no problem with staying connected. Of course, you couldn't pick up a telephone. There were no cell phones then. You couldn't pick up a telephone like you see now where they can call each other and, and view each other on the, the screens. That didn't exist. But you could, you could, uh, you could uh, when you came ashore, you could, it was telephones, just public telephones and things like that. Yeah. But life was a little slower then too. It's not as rapid as it is today. You know, this communication is worldwide today. It just, uh, they'll know it, as I say, they'll know it quicker out of sea than you will on the land. Yeah. If you, when you look back today, do you, do you have any regrets? Is there anything you wish you would have done that you didn't? No, no, no. Um, I, went into, I went into a specialty in, in, in dentistry, uh, orthodontics, which requires an additional two to three years of training after you get out of dental school. So I wanted to do that. Uh, 
I, I wanted to do that when I, I had a pretty good idea. I wanted to follow that line when I was in school. But of course, I knew I would have to re do my military service. So that was an interruption in between graduating from dental school. Then I went in the Navy for a couple of active duty for a couple of years. At that time, let me let me add one other thing. At that time, the laws were different depending upon where and how you went into service and what you did. And there were, there were specialty rules like physicians and dentists because they knew they didn't have to train them. They were already trained when they go in. So it's a different story than a recruit that, that joins the, the service out of high school or something or college even and has no specific need. Then the service will train them if they're, if they're uh, adaptable to that type of work. But as far as a physician or dentist, the Navy doesn't train you. You already have that training when you go in. So they put you right to work. That's your specialty. That's what you do. You don't do anything else. That's all they ask of you is to do that. Did you, you enjoyed doing what you did on being the... In the service? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. I, I thought it was, it, was a, it was a wonderful experience. And you meet a lot of nice people, great people in the service. Um, officers and enlisted men, they're all, they're all great. But maybe it's because of the type of dude. They all know who you are on a ship. So, and they, so uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a wonderful experience, whether you want to make it a career or not. Now, I had a lot of classmates. I would say that I can remember maybe six or eight, maybe ten, that stayed in the military, different branches. Some were in the Air, Co Air Force. Uh, there were uh, two or three that stayed in the Navy, and, uh, and, we, and uh, there were a couple in the Army that stayed in and made it a career. They liked it so much, they decided to stay in the military because they could still do the work that they, they wanted to do. Your, your colleagues, did they come from all over the place? Like what? Oh, yes. Well, different, well m most of them, I would say, uh, no, we had, we had some, uh, some uh, classmates. I had one classmate from Utah. Now, that's a long way, halfway across the country or better. But uh, we did. We had a lot from, uh, all, I would say the majority of, uh, of uh, classmates were from the northeast part of the country See, because that's, the school is in Washington, D.C., which is the, the eastern coast. All right, so what was it like coming back home after your service? For me, it was, it was uh, another thing. I went, I got, I got out of service in August of 19, active duty. Now, you have to remember, when you go in at that time, uh, when you went in, they had what they call a Physicians and Dentists Selected Service Act. All these things are controlled by Congress, by congressional law. You just don't go and do anything you please. So at that time, that act required when you went in, uh, you, you see, you can't draft an officer. I don't know whether you realize this or not. Uh, you cannot draft an officer into the military. They enlist in the military. So at that time, the enlistment period was for eight years. You, were, you went... You could go on a minimum of two years active duty, but you could stay as long as you wanted on active duty, which means you're actively assigned like to a ship or a station, something like that. Once you go off of active duty, you go into a reserve, which means they can call you back at a moment's notice if they need you. And that takes another six years. So I never really, I never got a, my discharge papers from the Navy until 1964, 1965. I think it was 1964 when I when I finally got out of service. Yeah. So was it hard coming back into life? No, no, not at all. Because uh, I knew what I wanted to do. You get plenty of time. Nothing ever happens abruptly. There's always a time period where you can think about things. And I did. And and I would say in the winter of 55, early, uh, early 56, I applied to, uh, to Columbia University uh, uh, in New York City to... Uh, Are we interrupting? Uh, we're doing an interview. Uh -oh. Could we just... 
Thank you. Anyway, um, I knew what I wanted to do, so I applied to graduate school in New York at Columbia University, and uh, I was accepted. I was still in service, but I, I, I was accepted, so I knew where I'd be going. I got out of, off of active duty in August, and I started school in September, so I only had a month different. I knew exactly where I was going to wind up, what I would be doing for the next two years. Yeah. Did the serving in the Navy change, change you in any way? Did the military? Did, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I would say one, one thing it did, it gave me a lot of respect for people who serve in the military. Uh, as I say, you meet a lot of fine people, and uh, uh, I would say I have, a, I have a great deal of respect for anyone who serves in the military. Did you, did you, did you keep in touch with any of the... Um, the any of your comrades? Oh, yeah. For a while I did, yeah. Of course, I had a lot of classmates who were in the Navy, too. In fact, uh, uh, on a couple of occasions where uh, our ships might be in the same port at the same time. It's rare when that happens, but it did happen. I had one classmate that was on a heavy cruiser, and he happened to be come into Norfolk at the same time we did. Uh, so I got a chance to see him. Uh, it's a different life. And, and one thing about the Navy, uh, you can say, well, I, I went to sea on a ship, but actually a life aboard ships, sea duty as we called it, is, it can be different from one type of ship to another. So you got to see, I had another classmate that was on the, um, I think at that time it was the Wisconsin. That's a battleship. They're no, these ships are no longer in service. You have to remember they were all World War II ships. They're gone now. All these big ships in the Navy are what? Nuclear powered. I mean, it's a totally different life. Uh, I got to see him. And uh, to go from an aircraft carrier to a battleship is like uh, one of a, let me see, it's like going from night to day or day to night, whichever one you put it. It's a totally different type of life because right? it's a different type of action. Different, uh, different responsibilities, things like that. But I did, yes, I, and I saw that, I saw a lot of these fellas uh, up until recent years. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of them have passed away now, so. Um, did serving, or you know what, I'm sorry. How did you, how did you feel when you got your papers that said you didn't have to, then, that you didn't have to uh, return to the Navy? You mean my discharge papers? Um, I knew what was coming, and it was fine. I was a civilian, and, 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 uh, but I never regretted for a minute serving. And uh, if I had to do it again, of course, I'm too old now, but this is all just supposition. I wouldn't, it would not bother me to go back again, serve again. It wouldn't? No, absolutely you not. You enjoyed it that much? I would go back and serve again, yes, if they called me. Of course, they're not going to call me now. I'm too old. But uh, I, it wouldn't bother me. I, 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 really, I, I, I really enjoyed it, and I'm glad I did it. You know, so I would say to young people, if they're anticipating or thinking about the service, it's not a bad idea. There are a lot of benefits. Of course, there's always griping, and uh, it's like everything else. You gripe a lot in civilian life about things, too that you have no control over. But um, I would say today, for a young, a young person, male or female today, uh, of course, when I was in service, there was absolutely no contact with females, very little. That was a shore base duty, and you would never, but it's completely different today. But I would say, male or female, if they're contemplating time and service, it's, it's, it's oh, oh, particularly if they're not sure what they want to do, with the rest of their life, it's a great opportunity to, to, to find out what you're adapt at or what you think you might like to study, and you'd be surprised today in service. Of course, service is, is, is much more involved today. It's, it's more technically involved than it ever had been in my time. I mean, I, don't, I, I, I can see why the, the services require a, a, uh, an individual who's got a lot on the ball today because it, it, there's an awful lot to learn. And 
you young fellas know that today with this. It, it, it's totally different. It isn't just slinging a rifle over your shoulder or carrying a pail. You might do that, but go, that's discipline training. They have to have that in service, discipline. In other words, when you're told to do something, you don't have time to think, well, do I want to do that or do I not want to do it? You do it. But that, beside that, uh, today a young fellow who, who uh, doesn't quite know what he in, in the particularly in the field of electronics, I think today it's, a, it's an open field. And for, for a, 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 a young individual, male or female, who's bent that way, that's a great learning experience for them. Plus the benefits they get out of it today. I mean, you know, monetary benefits for your education. It's, it's like a walk in the park. I mean, why would you pass it up? Uh, if I were looking back today, and I were 18 years old, 19, 20, I would seriously consider going into service. If you, if you think there's a particular line of service that you would like, that's the way to go. And, it, and it, it's well worth the three or four years that you put in because you, the benefits that you accrue from it, uh, I mean, you couldn't do that in a, in a civilian life. There's no way you could afford it, number one. So we're, we're wrapping up here. We're at 31 minutes, and I was actually going to ask you one final question about if, if, we had, if, if you were going to tell any of our classmates if they wanted to join the military, what advice would you give them? Just exactly what I told you. Seriously think about it because you hear a lot of things that are not so, and until you get in there yourself. But I would say uh, any young fellow, young classmate of yours that was contemplating uh, uh, or, or maybe didn't really know what they wanted to do or didn't, didn't have the funds available. That's the thing you gotta look at today is the cost of things. And uh, if, if you're bent that way mechanically, electrically, anything like that, I say that's a great way to go. And, uh, and it, you, get, you get wonderful experience, uh, plus the benefits that you get out of it. And I know today there are people who served in the military that have that kind of, of background electronics, they can come out and almost name their job. They're just dying to get a hold of them because they know what type of training they get. You get training in the service today that would cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars if you had to pay for it on the outside, and you may never still get that type of training. So anyone, I would recommend to, to uh, any of your classmates that are thinking that way seriously to pursue it, to look into it because it's, it's, it's a great benefit. It may not seem that way today, but uh, another thing, the time goes so quick, you don't know where it goes. It just flies by, and particularly in the military, because they keep you busy all the time. So if, if, if you're thinking that way, think, think hard on it and don't turn it down. That's my advice to them. Well, thank you for answering our questions. Well, uh, I'm glad I could sit down with you, young fellows, and and uh, this sounds like a very worthwhile project that you're uh, you're doing here. And uh, as I understand it, this is a a a what a an ongoing study that you're doing, contemplating different eras and different ages and things like that. Well, that's wonderful. Now, what happens with this interview now? Is it added into this program or? Um. It goes in 